Greetings. Welcome back to Media Matters. I'm your host, Bob McChesney, here in WILL AM 580. Today, our guest is well, someone who really doesn't need much of an introduction, Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics at MIT, author of numerous books and articles on politics and language, and probably the best-known guest we've ever had on our program. Uh, we're doing this program, uh, recording it a couple weeks before going on air, uh, so please don't call in. Uh, sit back, relax, and let us do the talking today. Noam Chomsky, welcome to Media Matters. Very glad to be back with you. Well, uh, what I'd like to talk about today, when we've had you on the show before, we've oftentimes talked about U.S. foreign policy, the Middle East, the wars in Iraq, militarism and empire, uh, questions that have been central to your political work for your adult life. Uh, and I want to talk maybe about those to some extent, but really I'd like to focus on st other themes that you've talked about throughout your life, too, that relate to this, which is the United States, uh, the domestic scene. And recently you were at the Left Forum in New York City, and you gave the keynote address there. And the title of your keynote address was The Center Cannot Hold Rekindling the Radical Imag Imagination. And uh, I had the privilege of reading a draft of the talk. And I'd like to talk a little bit about your assessment about where we are in the United States today. And let's maybe start with the title, The Center Cannot Hold. What do you mean by that? Actually, the, that was the uh, theme of the Left Forum. Uh, but I was happy with it. it uh, and what they're saying is that the uh, the mainstream political system is collapsing. Uh, there is, and, and they're right. Uh, the uh, uh, hatred of uh, public hatred of and contempt for uh, Congress, uh, the executive, in fact, just about all institutions, is at historic heights. I mean, right now, about half the population thinks that. Every member of Congress, including their own representatives, should be kicked out. Uh, and uh, the distrust and distrust is just enormous. Uh, I, I, I can't remember a period like it. In fact, in that talk, I mentioned the one thing that it reminds me of: late Weimar Germany. If you go back to late Weimar Germany, that's just what was happening. And by late Weimar, just for the sake of some of our younger listeners who have been victims of our public education <laughs> system, we're referring to Germany in the 1920s, immediately 1920s prior to the early 30s. Yeah. I mean, if you, you know, Hitler was uh, appointed chancellor by Hindenburg, who hated him. He, Hindenburg was an aristocrat. He hated this little corporal, as he called him. But he had to appoint him chancellor just because of the enormous popular support in 1933. Now, in 1928, five years earlier, uh, the Nazis had gotten less than 3% of the vote. Uh, but uh, very similar to this. I mean, the tradition, there were traditional liberal conservative parties that had been in power you know, ever since uh, the Reich was established. Uh, and they were squabbling, uh, not doing anything. I mean, people were just sick of them. They wanted to destroy the whole parliamentary system. And when this charismatic figure came along, uh, offering them hope, you know, power, uh, uh, restoring Germany's uh, magnificence and on and on. And he, you know, he was charismatic. Uh, he was sent by the Lord to do all this. Uh, they uh, swept the country. I mean, by 1933, in, in, uh, the uh, Nazis, shortly after they took power, uh, declared May Day a uh, workers' holiday. The left parties had never been able to do that. And the left parties were very strong in Germany. It's mm -hmm. not like here. The Social Democrats and the Communists were huge parties, and uh, they had associations, and, you know, the, the whole... It was built, in, it, based in a real live community. They'd never been able to do it. The Nazis did it. Uh, a million people showed up in uh, Berlin, which was called Red Berlin, because it was a left city. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just went on from there. By the time you get to 1939, you know, the beginning of the war, estimates are that about 90% of the population was right behind them. It's un uncannily similar to what's going on here. Are you referring specifically, when you talk about uh, the Nazi movement and the Third Reich, to what we see in what the Tea Party movement here in the United States? What's called the Tea Party movement, which you know has maybe no coherent, uh, in fact, the only coherent 
ideology it has is let's shoot ourselves in the feet because uh, their their policies, if you look at them, are going to be self are self destructive. But it is appealing to people people who think the the political system is shot. Nobody pays any attention to us. Uh, these are people with real grievances, as in Germany. I mean, for 30 years, you know, ever since the financialization of the economy set in, uh, uh, wages have stagnated, declined for the majority. Uh, benefits, which were never great, have declined. The uh, uh, working hours have increased. Uh, debt has increased. And they see there's plenty of wealth. I mean, there is ostentatious wealth. Uh, but it's going in the very few pockets. We have probably the worst inequality in the country's history. And right now, in the last year or two, what people see is uh, devastating. Um, the banks crashed the economy. The government moved in to save them, meaning the taxpayer bailed them out. Uh, now the banks are doing great and we're still unemployed. Uh, so here you've got this completely dysfunctional political system Parties don't care about us. Uh, the government obviously doesn't. Uh, okay, someone comes along with a message that says, I care about you, and here's something that will bring us all together. It's, uh, you know, I don't want to say it's the Nazis, but it's, there's a kind of similarity that's eerie. And in fact, it's extremely... Uh, well, also, the sort of, the, we're, something's been lost. It's a heroic past that it's to be they're resurrected. They're reconstructing yeah. the heroic past. Yeah. I mean, it's something that... Uh, you know, Reagan was able to do that's noble history and so on and so forth. And that's that's deep in American society. It goes way back even in, uh, in intellectual culture as well. You know, American exceptionalism, the, uh, the world's against us, uh, we got to defend ourselves, uh, we got to sort of control the world in order to defend ourselves. If we want to send drones out to kill somebody in Yemen, we got to do it to defend ourselves and so on. So that uh, kind of nationalist fervor, uh, the you know, recovery of an imagined uh, heroic past, uh, uh, fits very well with the sense of, you, uh, you can't really call it discontent, that's not strong enough, but the uh, kind of hopelessness and uh, fear about the internal collapse, they go together. And it's huge by now, latest polls about... Uh, Close to half the population sympathize with with the what they call the Tea Party movement. They're not in it, but they sympathize mm -hmm. with its mood. You know, the patriotic. Um, you know, uh, it's it's quite it's quite interesting if you look at their actual views. I mean, it's just an off. It's just essentially run by the corporate sector. I mean, they're the ones who provide the funding, the ideology, and they know what they're doing. And they have a very tricky propaganda message, which has been going on for 50 years. Uh, uh, business propaganda has to do two contradictory things. It has to get people to hate the government and regard the government as an enemy, you know, like some alien force, uh, and say we're in favor of small government and so on. On the other hand, they have to get people to love the government and want a big government, a powerful state. Uh, so take Reagan, you know, he's considered the apostle of... Uh, Free markets and uh, you know small government. I mean, the government grew under Reagan. He was the most protectionist president in post-war American history. Believed in massive intervention in the economy, but they constructed the image, and uh, there are now uh, you know a, a very very standard now. You know probably a large majority says oh, we got got to get rid of the federal government. It's uh, in our hair. You know it's it's mm -hmm. too big. It's uh, uh, it's deeply in debt and so on. At the other hand, these very same people are uh, massively supporting government growth mm -hmm. and government power. And for the business world, that means uh, we need a big state but a nanny state for the rich. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about cutting government, we mean cutting everything that you care about. <laughs> and, and to sell that message is rather sophisticated, and they've done a good job on it.